Happy Monday, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are watching me from around the world. Thank you for joining me for this week's live teaching. I am Krista Bontrager. I am a theologian and public apologist, and this is the show where I offer teaching about the Bible as well as theological commentary on social issues. This is part two of an extended teaching series that I am doing right now called Everyday Evangelism. Now, last week I kicked things off with a live teaching entitled, Why Aren't We Sharing the Gospel? Where I attempted to review a number of the obstacles of what I, that I often hear when talking to people about why they don't share their faith. I truly hope that you have started a conversation with the Lord about your own obstacles to sharing the faith, asking him for his insight and wisdom about how you can make progress in this area, maybe asking him to bring you into a clearer conviction or commitment to things you need to change in your mindset, your attitude, your life choices. But I do hope that you are making progress in this area of your spiritual life and that that will continue as we unfold these conversations together. I know that I'm in that conversation, so I do hope that you are too. Now, toward the end of the teaching, I gave a basic definition of the word gospel, which we said means good news. It means to proclaim glad tidings. It comes from the Greek word euangelion. And this is where we get the word evangelism or evangelical. It comes from the Greek word euangelion. We also, toward the end, did a brief look at one key passage related to the gospel as it is laid out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it focuses on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And just on that one key passage, we could already see that whatever the gospel is, it is far more than merely accepting Jesus into our heart. It is an invitation, I said, to an entirely different worldview. And this is an, an, an idea that we will continue to unpack in today's teaching and next week's teaching as well. Now, I've entitled the teaching for today, The Gospel According to Jesus. We are going to do a big picture survey of Jesus's core message during his earthly ministry and to define the good news that he proclaimed during his earthly ministry. Then next week, we're going to do uh, a second teaching that goes along with this one called The Gospel According to the Apostles. And we're going to gather more data. We're going to be looking at Acts as well as the epistles, all in an effort to help us define the gospel or the good news of the New Testament. So don't freak out if today seems a little incomplete. Just know there's a second half of this teaching that's coming next week. I didn't think you wanted to uh, commit to Mike Winger level videos here. So uh, I'm trying to break it into smaller chunks as we go along. Now, you might be asking yourself, why in the world does Krista want to lead us into a two-hour Bible lesson in order to define the gospel? It should be very simple. That seems like overkill. Well, here is why I think that this level of depth is necessary. What I've noticed is that progressive Christians have a tendency to define the gospel by focusing almost exclusively on the ministry of Jesus, leaving out the data in the Acts and the Epistles, and then reading the data of the Gospels through the lens of social justice and liberation theology. And while that approach can have certainly have kernels of, of truth to it, it also presents a kind of truncated version of the good news. Likewise, I think the error on the other side of the street is that I've noticed that many American evangelicals tend to focus 
almost exclusively on the epistles when defining the gospel. And they'll often use, you know, the book of Romans, the Romans road, or 1 Corinthians 15, that sort of thing. And they will leave out the key major theme that we are going to highlight today from Jesus's ministry, as well as the early preaching of the apostles. So this is why I want to take our time and gather as much data as possible in order to make sure that you have a good foundation for what the gospel is, what is this good news, before we run around and proclaim some kind of truncated version of it. So we're going to talk a lot about scripture today. I'm going to be showing a lot of passages on the screen, and I want to strongly encourage you to read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for yourselves, to be a Berean, to pursue the interpretation of all of the passages we're going to look at uh, in context. I can't uh, break this down again, because if I were to look at you know, the minutia of every single passage we're going to go through today, this teaching would be eight hours long. But that's not to say that I haven't done my due diligence in wanting to make sure I'm interpreting passages in context, not just cherry picking a bunch of things to fit my agenda. So I do want to encourage you, test all things, you know, and to look at the larger context of these passages, get out your Bibles, read along with us, and continue to read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John over and over and over. That's really the best way to begin to see themes emerge. So, all right, with that, uh, let's get into it. Now, the life of Jesus must first and foremost be understood in the broader context of the Jewish people. Jesus was a Jew. I don't like it when people say Jesus was a Middle Easterner, he was a Palestinian. I've gone over that in a bunch of conversations last December. It's just the simplest, most accurate way of saying it is that Jesus was a Jew. In fact, the very first verse of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, says that Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, this is Jesus in his original context, okay? You don't get more Jewish than that. Son of David, son of Abraham. He's born to Jewish parents and he grew and he grew up in a Jewish city. All right. Jesus was a Jew. Generations before Jesus, King David received a promise from God that said his throne, his household would be established forever. And we read that in 2 Samuel chapter 7. God makes him the promise, your, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is a promise that God is making that there is a descendant who will come after him that will be a king forever, okay? Well, when we, we hop forward and we see, well, Jesus was a son of David. He was born of the lineage of David, okay? He is part of what was in line for that. Let's scroll down to the next passage here because part of what I'm doing here is, is creating the setup for what the Jews were expecting when it came to being a king. So now we are going to skip to this prophecy from Isaiah chapter 9. It says, For us, to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So with the anticipation 
of this descendant of David who will reign on his throne forever and ever is a king. We call this a Messiah. And that he is coming to bring a government. Okay. He is going to be a king who is going to be a gov- bring a government. Let's scroll down a little bit more to the book of Daniel and read one more prophecy that is fulfilled in Jesus. This is from Daniel chapter seven. It says, uh, in, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man. You might recall son of man is a title that Jesus frequently uses in his ministry. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. So whoever the son of man is, he's different than the ancient of days. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. This is a description of a king. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Another word for dominion is kingdom. It is a kingdom that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So this is the messianic expectation that Jesus was born into, son of David, that there would be a king who would come and establish a kingdom that would never end. These predictions came to be connected with the messianic expectation of a king who would reign, he would come, he would usher in a time of a reign of prosperity and peace for the Jews. So when we are introduced to the ministry of Jesus at the beginning of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in particular, we see Jesus coming onto the scene, proclaiming the good news, what we call the gospel, the euangelion. As the story of Jesus unfolds, we see that he is the fulfillment of this messianic kingly expectation that was laid out in the Old Testament. Let's start with Mark chapter 1. It says this, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming, what does it say? The good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So what is this good news? Just in these couple of verses, there's a whole lot happening. You have to know the backstory of the messianic expectation, the expectation of this king and this kingdom that would come. And it says, the good news is that it has come. The good news of everything that we expected in the Old Testament has come near. And then what does Jesus do? He tells two action steps, repent and believe. The first words of Jesus in his public ministry in the Gospel of Mark is repent and believe. At this point, we start to see a pattern that will emerge in the Gospels. And that is this, that the good news is that Jesus is proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come. He is proclaiming and he is demonstrating that he that the kingdom of God has come. And, and in that demonstration, he, he demonstrates that he has power and authority, that, that he is a king who comes with power and authority. But as we're going to see in just a minute, what he comes with power and authority over is not the Romans, okay? It is not to... Um, get rid of the Roman government. Rather, it is to bring and plant a new kingdom right in the middle of Rome. And the thing that he has power and authority over is sickness and demons and death. Now, I want to draw your attention here to what we're going to notice is that there is a close association 
between proclaiming the kingdom of God and demonstrating the kingdom of God. Okay. So these things are so closely related that we, we almost see them happening side by side and almost inter used interchangeably from each other. So let's start in Luke's gospel in chapter four. And again, I want to urge you to read all of these passages in their original context. I'm going to be going very fast here. All right. So Luke chapter four, we pick up the story of Jesus. This is right after the birth account, right after his genealogy. And now he's going into the wilderness. He's not yet in public ministry, but he um, is going into the temptations. And notice that we see right in verse one, he was full of the Holy Spirit. All right. And he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he's tempted. Now, I want you to notice the second temptation. So he says, the devil leads him to a high place and shows him, notice what it shows him, all the kingdoms of the world. So what is the nature of this temptation? It's kingdoms, it's authority, it's rule. But Satan wants to apparently give him some kind of a shortcut some kind of a way of going past the father's plan and getting a different kingdom and he, and Jesus and he says to Jesus I will give you all their authority and splendor it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to if you worship me it will all be yours Jesus Answer is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So Jesus didn't fall prey to that. He was not going with the Father's plan to establish his kingdom. Okay, a few verses later, Jesus returned to Galilee after the temptations. And here again, we see the mention of the power of the Holy Spirit. News about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues. Everyone praised him. So word is starting to spread. He went to Nazareth, his hometown, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. Now, this is something that a rabbi would do. And if we had read in the context back in chapter three, we would read that he is the age of a rabbi, you know, that he's starting his ministry when he was 30 years old. So he goes into the synagogue at his hometown, reads the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, was handed to him, unrolling it. He found the place where it is written. I want you to notice here what it says. The spirit of the Lord is on me. We've already read that a few times. The Holy Spirit is on him because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. Evangelion. What is this good news? He's been anointed to proclaim it to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolls up the scroll. It gives it back to the attendant and sits down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue are fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He's making a very direct claim that person that you read about in the Old Testament, the Messiah, the son of David, you are looking for, I am he. I'm the one. I'm the one that, that Isaiah 61 is about. Continuing in Luke chapter 4, after the reading, there's some back and forth dialogue. And he says, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and they drove him out of town. Imagine bombing your sermon so bad that they want to drive you out of town take you to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw you off the cliff. That's a bad day of teaching. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Now, I want you to notice exactly what happens after this messianic claim, what happens next. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. So he's leaving Nazareth, going to Capernaum. And on the Sabbath, he taught the people. And they were amazed at his teaching. Because his words had what? Authority. So if you want to circle that word in your Bible, it's a word for you to look for. 
He had authority. They were amazed at his teaching. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, go away. What do you have with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I know who you are. You're the Messiah. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. So he sends a command. He rebukes that spirit. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed. They were amazed. There's that phraseology again. And they said to her, what words are these? What words these are? With Here's, here's two key words to circle in your Bible. With authority and power, he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. So here again, we've got what was said earlier in chapter four, that the news is spreading. So what does he have power and authority over? He said, first, he makes a claim, I am the Messiah. I'm the one you've been looking for. And then he immediately demonstrates and proclaims the good news. How does he do it? He drives out a demon. Okay. And he speaks and teaches with authority. All right. Let's keep, let's keep scrolling. We're still in Luke chapter four. Jesus left the synagogue and he went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. So he's now demonstrating the kingdom of God through healing and casting out demons. Okay, let's keep going. We're still in Luke chapter four. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary, solitary place. The people were looking for him and they came to where he was and they tried to keep him from leaving. But he said, here's, here's the key to the whole thing. You want to underline this in your Bible. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns because this is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues and the synagogues of Judea. So what is he doing? He's proclaiming and demonstrating the kingdom of God has come. That is the good news. That is what Jesus is up to. Now let's keep going. Now we're going to switch over to Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter four, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues. Notice the wording here. You can underline this proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Now, how does he do this? He proclaims the good news of the kingdom, and then he demonstrates it, healing every disease and sickness of the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed, and he healed them. This is a great summary of what it is that Jesus is up to. He's the good news. He's proclaiming and demonstrating the kingdom of God has come. All right, Matthew chapter 9. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What I want you to start to notice here is the repetition, proclaiming, demonstrating the good news through healing and through casting out demons. This is what the core is of what Jesus is teaching. And this is the good news. The kingdom of God has come. At this point, hopefully you can see a pattern. I could have gone through a lot more scriptures, but again, I want to encourage you to read through the gospels for yourself, but we can see a little bit of a pattern starting to emerge. And that is that the good news is that Jesus is proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come. And as he is proclaiming that 
He is demonstrating that he has power and authority over sickness and demons. Okay, now, even though <laughs> the kingdom of God is one of the key themes of Jesus' teaching, I would say it's the core theme that Jesus is teaching, it's really not that well understood for most Christians. I think if you asked everyone in your small group to define the kingdom of God, you would probably get a variety of answers. And because of this confusion, I want to unpack a few more specifics of what the Bible means, what Jesus meant when he was talking about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God has come. I want to look at a few of the parables of Jesus. And in order to illustrate a little bit more of what the kingdom of God is like, but again, I want to encourage you, read the gospels. Um, once you start seeing this kingdom of God focus, it, it really just starts jumping off on practically every page, especially in the, the first half of the gospels. I'm going to give you just a quick little snapshot here. Think of this as like you're walking through Costco and you're getting a little free sample, okay? We're just gonna do a quick 30,000 foot survey of a few of the parables of Jesus when he teaches about the kingdom. And I've selected only parables in Matthew just to give you a little bit of a sampling. Okay, we're gonna, a lot of these are in Matthew chapter 13. So one of the parables says, told him a parable, the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of heaven is the way that, that Matthew talks about the kingdom of God, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in a field. Those, the smallest of seeds, you know, when it grows, is the largest of plants. It becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in it. Okay, now when we read a parable, we want to look for the key idea, the one key idea. Well, what does it say? It says, uh, the kingdom of God, you want to know what the kingdom of God is? Well, it's kind of like this. And then he compares it to something. And he does this over and over and over again. In this case, he says, it's like a mustard seed that starts off small and gets big. He continues in the next parable. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. So another comparison he makes is that it's 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 like it's not only just small, it starts small and then it gets big, has a big outcome, a big effect. It also has this like transforming effect, kind of like when you put yeast in dough and then you watch it rise over time, it it becomes something else. It it has this transforming effect throughout the whole dough. That's kind of what the kingdom of God is like. Let's read a few more parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had so he could buy that field. You know what the kingdom of heaven is like? It's, it's so precious and so valuable that you ought to want to pursue it, even if it costs you all your worldly goods. You you want to go after it. You want to you want to grab it. You want to lay hold of it, and you're even willing to sacrifice your earthly goods in order to get it. You know what else the kingdom of heaven is like? It's like a merchant looking for fine pearls. He found one when he found one of great value. He went away and sold everything he had and bought it. It's so much more valuable than anything this world has to offer. That is what the kingdom of God is like. So what have we learned so far? The kingdom of God has come. We've learned that it's to be prized and pursued. Well, how then do we become a citizen of this kingdom? Well, let's check out again some verses from Matthew and, and Mark. Matthew chapter 3 starts with the ministry of John the Baptist, and he is preaching um, in the wilderness of Judea. And he says, notice his words here, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Okay? And then what did they do in verse 6? 
confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So it's a call to repentance, and then there's a response to confessing their sins. But when he saw the many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he, when he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I can tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What is happening here is that John is telling the Jewish leaders, he, he's clarifying who the real Jews are, okay? He's, he, in a way, he's telling the Jewish people, you're outside of the covenant. You need to come in and be part of the real covenant. Repent and believe and be baptized. And he's telling the Jewish leaders, you're so far out of the covenant, he calls them snakes. And he says, you know, these rocks are more related to Abraham than you are. Okay. So it's, it's trying to get their attention that although they think they are on the inside, they are actually on the outside of the covenant. And he exhorts them to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, repentance isn't just words, it's actions. It starts with a change of mind, but then it's actions where your life conforms to, to your allegiance. Okay, let's go back to the scripture. So then notice on the next page in Matthew chapter four, what happens in Jesus's ministry. When Jesus heard that John had been put into prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth, living in Capernaum. And then what I want to show you in verse 17 is that when Jesus, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. So both Mark's gospel that we already read earlier and Matthew's gospel, the first real public words that Jesus says in his ministry are repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. This is a major focus in Jesus's ministry and in John the Baptist's ministry. Calling people to repentance is literally some of the first words we hear Jesus say in his ministry. And yet I have to ask the question, how often do we hear these words today in when we are doing evangelism? Repent of your sins produce fruit that is consistent with that repentance. Sometimes we hear evangelism talking about confessing your sins. I'm sort of 50-50 on whether I hear that. We, we might hear water baptism, but how often do we hear repent, turn away, renounce, have a change of mind, those things that you were doing stop doing, do something different, and then produce fruit in keeping with repentance. This is much more close to the message of the good news that John the Baptist proclaimed, that Jesus proclaimed, and I would say that the apostles proclaimed. Now, the reverse is also true. What keeps people out of the kingdom of God? Well, Let's go back out to Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 11. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. So if repentance is the door to coming into citizenship of the kingdom, not repenting is the thing that will keep you out of the kingdom. Who's in the kingdom and who's not in the kingdom? 
is differentiated by who has repented. Woe to you, Chorazim and Bethsaida, for if miracles, or if the miracles that were performed in you have been performed in Tyre and Sidon, in other words, where the pagans live, where the pagans are sacrificing to other gods, they would have repented long ago. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for the pagans on the day of judgment than for you. Okay? So how do we get into the kingdom? Is through repentance. What keeps us out of the kingdom is our lack of repentance. Matthew 21, it says, Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him. Here's this word again, by what authority are you doing these things? Remember we talked about power and authority at the beginning of the teaching? Who gave you this authority? In other words, what rabbi did you study under? How did you get this information? What is the authority you speak in? Because I don't know what rabbi you studied under. That's what they're asking. Where did you go to seminary? Where did you get your PhD? Who did you study with? Jesus replied, I will also ask you a question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from a human origin? They discussed it among themselves. And they said they could see the horns of the dilemma here. If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why don't you why didn't you believe in him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, and they all hold John to be a prophet. So they answered to Jesus, We don't know. And then he said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. And then he tells a parable of the two sons. And it is a parable about one son who told his father, no, I'm not going to go out in the field and work. But then later reconsidered and he went out and he worked. And then the second son said, yeah, father, I'll go out and work. But then he did it. And Jesus says to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness. He showed you how to live. He, he, he was teaching you how to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes, those who didn't, they didn't believe in me at first. They didn't obey my righteousness, my, my commands, my laws, my statutes. They didn't do that at first, but they are doing it now. They have repented of their sins. They have come into the kingdom. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. This is all a question of who's in and who's out. Who's inside the covenant, who's out. Who's inside the kingdom and who's out. The people who think that they are a shoe in to be in the kingdom are definitely the religious leaders. But they're not wanting to come into it through the correct door. They don't want to come into it through repentance. They want to come into it because of their birth connection to Abraham. And Jesus is trying to tell them, in this government, in this government, you're not born into citizenship. You have to come into citizenship. You have to make a conscious decision to come join and be a citizen of this kingdom, of this government. So you might think you're born into it, but that's not how it works. In Messiah's kingdom, you must be intentional. And the way in, the path to citizenship is repentance. Okay? So this is the sifting that I think Jesus alludes to in the parables that we see in Matthew chapter 13. It tells talks about the wheat and the tares growing up together. And this is from Matthew chapter 13. Jesus told them another parable. You know what the kingdom of heaven is like? It's like a man who sowed good seed into his field, but while everyone was sleeping, one night an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then he went away, and then they were just kind of all growing up together. And this owner's servant said, you know, shouldn't we try to sort this out? <laughs> and 
he, he says, no, let's not pull them up. Because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat as well. Let's just let them grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them into bundles and let them be burned. And then gather the wheat and bring it into my barns. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is going to be something where you're going to see some people that you're going to wonder, like, are they really citizens of the real kingdom? Who are these people? Who are these kind of imposters that are growing up side by side? The great judge is going to sort that out at the last days. The parable of the net. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into a lake and it caught all kinds of fish. And then when it was full, the fishermen were pulling it up on the shore and they sat down. They collected the good fish in baskets and they threw the bad ones away. This is how it'll be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. We, we might see some people kind of trying to fly under the radar, being counterfeits, being imposters. But we know that the judge, the ultimate judge, the king, he's going to sort it out. And it's going to be just and it's going to be fair. And he's got perfect discernment. And he's going to know who the real people are who are on the inside, who the people are that are on the outside. Now, again, I'm moving you through early parts of the Gospels in very broad thematic strokes. Again, I hope, though, that you are you are beginning to see how the kingdom of God is so central to Jesus's message. You really cannot understand what Jesus is saying if you don't think about and meditate and reflect on the kingdom of God. So what are we saying about the good news? What is the good news? The good news is the proclamation and the demonstration that the kingdom of God has come. How does someone come into the kingdom? By repenting of their sins, okay? Believing in Jesus as the Messiah, and then eventually producing fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, after these kind of initial teachings about the kingdom, then the second half of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John usually turns our attention as the readers toward Jerusalem. And Jesus begins anticipating his death, burial, and resurrection. And that's kind of the next phase of ushering in the kingdom of God. So let's take a look at these first verses in the book of Hebrews in the next part of establishing God's kingdom. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, when did the last days start? It started when Jesus came. He has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word that he had provided purification for our sins, sat down at the majesty, at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. First Corinthians 15, starting at verse 23. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, in other words, the first to be resurrected, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. There are those words again. He's going to destroy all other kingdoms, all other authorities, all other powers, for he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. So, so far what we've seen is through Jesus' death and he has seated at the right hand of the Father. That means he's the king. He's the one who is ruling and reigning in his kingdom. And he is destroying all other kings, making them subservient to him. Colossians 1, for in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together and he is the head of the body, the church. 
He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. In other words, he's the first to rise from the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. He is king. He is the king of kings. He's supreme above all kings. He is ruling over things in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible. He is ruling over thrones and powers and authorities and everything you can imagine. He is the king. And how did this happen? It was through his death, burial, and resurrection. So how do we put all of this data together? Jesus has announced the kingdom of God has come. Even after his resurrection, Jesus' disciples were still confused. They thought, well, are you going to bring in the kingdom now? Are you going to crush the Romans now? They still were not getting it that this was an invisible kingdom. And so even after his resurrection, the disciples are still thinking, what kind of a kingdom is it that Jesus is talking about? They were still thinking it's primarily a physical kingdom. But with Jesus' resurrection and ascension, he is now ruling and reigning from heaven, and he is bringing everything under his feet. And when he comes again, he will establish the fullness of his kingdom. So... When we think about the good news, how many of you think, like your first thought about what is the good news, what is the gospel, it is that the kingdom of God has come and Jesus is ruling and reigning from heaven. It is the rule of God. Like how many of you, if we were in a classroom, I'd have you raising your hands. Like it's usually very few people, like that's their first association with the gospel is kingship. Usually we're thinking about him as a savior, focusing on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And again, that is part of the gospel, and we will see that next week. But in the teaching and ministry of Jesus, the primary message of the good news is that the kingdom of God has come. There is a Messiah who has come and fulfilled the expectations of the Jews. God is ruling. But this is not a kingdom about setting up earthly palaces. And this is why I think it's Jesus says in John 18, when he's about to be arrested, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not about building earthly palaces. In Acts 17, Paul says that the creator doesn't live in temples made by hands, human hands. It is an invisible kingdom. It is not a human government. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, and he asked them, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor are they going to say, look, there it is, or there, there's the kingdom of God. No, that's that's not what it is. It's that God is in you. And so wherever God's people are, that's where the kingdom of God is. If the kingdom of God is not first and foremost a physical place, then what is it? It is primarily a kingdom that is about reversing the curse. Remember Adam and Eve back in Genesis? They were created to do what? They were created to rule and to reign, to have dominion over creation. They were appointed as God's governors. But things became corrupted after the fall and like a deadly mold that just spread its poison into everything it touched. Human relationships were destroyed and humanity's ability to perfectly and justly rule God's creation was also corrupted. And Jesus came to start that long process of restoring life to the creation. He taught his people how to become citizens of his kingdom and then how to live as citizens of his kingdom. He taught us how to love others. He inaugurated a way to transform wicked human hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll see more about that next week. And we, we learn about the doorway into the kingdom is through repentance 
And without repentance, people remain outside of the kingdom. They cannot become citizens of the kingdom. The kingdom also means that Jesus as the Messiah has power and authority over sin, death, and the devil. He And to prove that, he forgave sins, and he cast out demons, and he healed the sick, and he raised the dead. But the kingdom is also a message about God's redemptive work accomplished through the, the, the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. And, and by conquering death, he became the king who rules and is reigning from heaven and putting everything under his feet. This is what I call an already not yet kingdom. The kingdom has come. Jesus is ruling and reigning. And when he comes again the second time, the kingdom will come into its fullness. So once someone comes into the kingdom and under God's governance, they're a new creation. They have citizenship in a new kingdom. They have new loyalties and new allegiances. In fact, it is an allegiance that is so powerful that it divides earthly families. Jesus says, I did, I did not come to bring peace, but a sort of division between mothers and daughters and mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws and sons and fathers. And that our true citizenship is displayed in who our loyalty is to. So how does this then impact how we do evangelism? Jesus is seen in the Gospels over and over and over again, going throughout all the cities and villages, bringing a message of the kingdom of God to where they live and everywhere he went, the, 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 the kingdom, the seeds of the kingdom were planted and, and began to flourish, except in towns where they, they wouldn't accept him as, as the Messiah. So, we see people hearing the, the good news that the king has come, the kingdom has come, and they start getting healed in the name of the king, and, and they're encouraged and edified, and they're in awe of the teaching, and they're radically transformed. They're never the same. But we don't, we don't see that. Our evangelistic efforts don't look like that a lot of times. Why is that? I've thought a lot about this for the last eight years or so, a lot. Why does our evangelism, especially in the West, so often seem so weak and so fearful and without the kind of transformational fruit that we see in the ministry of Jesus? Here's a thought that I've had about this. I think it's because, in part, I'm not saying this is the whole answer, but it's one of the answers that I've thought about it, and I, I think it's true, you can dry it on, is that we've exchanged the good news of the kingdom of God for a sales campaign. The marketing pitch often reduces the gospel to, you know, four easy steps, get the customer's attention, God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. Show the customer the need for what you're trying to sell them. You're a sinner, you need, you need forgiveness of your sins. That you demonstrate how the product you're selling will satisfy your need. Their need. Jesus is the Savior. And then you want to sign the client up. Here's a decision card. Say the sinner's prayer. We've got it so reduced down to these steps that it's almost hard for our minds to even comprehend. Wait a minute. When Jesus says the good news, it is the proclamation and the demonstration of the kingdom of God. What am I even supposed to do with that? Like, how do I ram that into a two-minute pitch? We, we've tried to make the gospel an easy sell. But I think that one of the reasons that our version of the message lacks power is because it is so truncated. And now, and, and that's not to say, and I, saw, I know somebody's going to come on the comments and say, well, you know, I was saved through some heretical teacher. God can use anything. Yeah, I, know, I understand that. God can use anything. But just because God can use anything and he works through our weakness, 
And, you know, he can even find a donkey to, to give a prophetic word. That doesn't mean that it's what he's really teaching in the Bible. Like, I don't think that his ideal is that his people just not apprehend the basics of what Jesus came to proclaim. Like, I'm I'm thinking that it's probably actually supposed to work a little bit differently than the sales pitch. Real evangelism, if I'm looking at the pattern and ministry of Jesus is that it involves inviting people into true discipleship. And that requires us to get beyond a mindset of just getting people to say a sinner's prayer and sign a card and get to the end of the sales pitch. We are inviting people, like I said last week, to an entirely different worldview. I think to maybe put it more biblically, the good news of the kingdom of God is a call to come under the authority of an entirely different government with a different law code of conduct and a different culture. And it involves having completely different allegiances. And this is what we have to begin to wrap our minds around. When we are engaging in evangelistic conversations, we need to be clearly communicating the reality that becoming a Christian is not simply adding Jesus to what we are already doing in our lives. It involves coming into a conviction that Jesus is king. And if it is true that Jesus is king and that he has conquered sin, death, and the devil, it means that he is inviting me to make him king over every square inch of my life. Now, the process of making that a reality, it will take a lifetime. It's not an instantaneous thing. But there is a very real sense in which it is true that Jesus is king of my life from the very moment that I repent of my sins and put my full faith, hope, and confidence that Jesus is the one that the world has been longing for. My loyalty is to obeying God first above all others, no matter what it costs me. So when, when Christians pledge allegiance to the flag of their country, we, we do it with a bigger truth in mind that our allegiance, our, a deeper allegiance is what we have, is to God. That it is deeper than any allegiance we have to, a, to an earthly government. We have a, 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 a higher allegiance, a deeper allegiance to a heavenly government. And so when I think about evangelism, I think about how politically divided so much of us are. And I've been wondering, like, how could we connect that division to an evangelistic or a gospel conversation? And I think that there is a deep longing in the hearts of humanity to look for political solutions. I don't think that's an American problem. I don't think that's a problem that's just emerged in the last 10 years. I think it's a it's a human problem. And if we look at back in human history, we will see that there is a deep longing in human hearts for solutions to living in a very broken world. And every civilization has looked for leaders to solve humanity's most basic problems. Now, in our context, in our country, you know, these people are on the right and on the left, and both sides are looking to conform systems and structures to their value system. Much like the ancient Jews were longing for a leader who would come and bring them out of the mess, I think that Jesus came into that knowing that rulers are corrupt and governments prefer justice, and he's meeting the human longing for a government that is pure justice. He is meeting in our hearts the longing that we have that we can have a new start. So, so when we're 
engaging in evangelism conversation, shouldn't we just at least try to present the faith within its context, its kingdom context, that when God decided to solve the problem that humans had created in the fall, that they had been created to rule and to reign, but they couldn't do it because sin came in and like this cancerous mold ruined their ability to to rule justly. God decided to solve that problem the humans had created, and he, he he did it by sending a king and a kingdom. He didn't send a social program. He didn't start an orphanage. He didn't start a, a retirement home. And we will discuss in due course the place of social programs in a future teaching and how that connects to the gospel. But for now, I just want us to know that when Jesus came, he, he came as a king and he pronounced a kingdom. He proclaimed the reign of God breaking into the darkness uh, uh, that provides a real hope, a deeper hope than any political leader can offer. And it means helping people understand that the problems in any culture and in any nation that we are face facing can only ultimately be solved through the invasion of another kingdom, a better kingdom. And as followers of Jesus, we don't just proclaim the message of the gospel in this half-hearted, or simple steps to prosperity kind of a way. We don't just leave it there. We, we go through the door of the kingdom and become citizens, and we put our lives on full display, living as citizens of the kingdom of God before our friends and family that they may mock us, that they may not understand us because we are living according to the rules of a different government and we have allegiance to a different king. But what is remarkable is that there will be the few who will see our lives and be drawn into the kingdom, drawn to God himself. And so when we talk about building the kingdom of God and proclaiming the kingdom of God, um, we have to know that that begins in each and every one of our lives as we make Christ Lord over every square inch of our lives. And one final thought. The kingdom of God is a bit mysterious. We don't always know how it is going to work. Somehow, and we don't know exactly how, but God's kingdom is advanced when we proclaim the gospel message and we live out the Christian worldview in front of others. It says in Mark 4, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or whether he gets up. The seeds sprout and grow, though he does not know how. It's the mystery of it. How is it that a seed turns into a plant? All by itself, the soil produces grain. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. We don't know exactly how it is that a seed becomes a plant. And we don't exactly know how the kingdom of God works, how it works that when we proclaim in our deficiency and in our difficulty and when we make mistakes that somehow some way the kingdom of god is still built i don't know how all of that works but i'm just trying to the best of my ability to be obedient and to put my life on display even with all of my failings and i do have so many but somehow some kind of a way God uses that to build his kingdom. Okay, I'm going to put a bookmark there for now. Next week, we'll just continue this discussion. I'll try to plan it a little better so it's not quite so long by moving into an examination of the teaching of the apostles and in the book of Acts when it comes to the good news. I look forward to your comments, your feedback, your questions as we continue this teaching series on everyday evangelism. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.